Well, good morning. I want to echo our congratulations to all of our high school graduates. I'm grateful that we can set aside a time to celebrate all that God has done in their lives. And what he's going to do is we send them out as champions for Christ. I'm not sure there's a more appropriate series to send off our high school graduates with and to talk about the making of a great church. Uh, many of them who are not going to be local are going to be looking for a church where they go, and, and this helps them to see, well, what is it that we should be looking for? And this particular topic today is uh, also paramount in that regard, and that is the topic of worship. Would you find in your Bibles Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 41 in just a moment? As you're turning there, let me say that it's also, uh, yesterday was a big day for a couple of our recent graduates here at Kingsland. Avery Skinner is a senior at the University of Kentucky. Maddie Skinner is a freshman at the University of Kentucky. And yesterday, they won a national championship in volleyball. How cool is that? So, in a sense, Kingsland won a national championship too. I mean, don't you think so? So. Congratulations, Mom, Rebecca. I know we have a proud mama. Rebecca serves in our family freedom ministry here, works here, and, and uh, Avery and Maddie are two godly young ladies, and uh, so proud of them. Acts chapter 2. Let me, let me say one other thing. Some of you were expecting Dr. Steve Jones to be preaching today, and you're saying, what in the world is pastor doing here? Don't get up and storm out. Uh, uh, Steve texted me a couple days ago and there is illness in the Jones household. It's not uh, COVID related, but it's sickness nonetheless. So four out of the eight Joneses are down. And so he is, uh, he is caring for his family. We pray for the Joneses today. And, and so uh, Eric Conley's preaching at the North Katy campus where I was going to be. And I have the privilege of being with you today, opening God's word. And so, so grateful for that. So we're talking today about worship. Let's look at verse 41 together. You look on as I read. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and, break, and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. You see, all through this description of the early church, we see glimpses of worship. They were filled with awe. There was prayer. There were wonders and signs. Verse 47, they were praising God. Obviously, worship was at the center of the existence of the early church. Are you a worshiper? Do you look forward to gathering for worship? Does your attitude of worship extend beyond gatherings to every part of life? Well, that's, uh, that's at the heart of who we are as followers of Christ. You know, the Bible commands worship. Uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 29, for one, says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. You know, the first uh, four of, of the Ten Commandments are given in Exodus chapter 20 relate to worship. Worship is not a song service leading up to the preaching, uh, as, as though some see it as sort of a prelude, prelude of the service. No, worship is the lifestyle of the believer. The word worship is an old Anglo-Saxon word translated literally worth-ship. And that's a great way to think about it. We're acknowledging the worth of Almighty God. So there's something different about the worship that's taking place in the second chapter of Acts than any other worship that took place prior to that time. Do you know what it is? You look back at verse 4 in Acts 2 and you find out why. It says, when they're in that upper room, then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. How did the worship of God's people change so radically when the church was born? They're not only worshiping their God, that had been done before, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit of God and worshiping their God. Do you see? Being filled with the Spirit changes worship. 
What does it mean to experience spirit-filled worship? Maybe depending on your background, you have certain ideas of what that term means. I want to look at the biblical definition of this and see how being filled with the Spirit should change our worship. So let me tell you what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled is another word for controlled in the Scripture. When I say I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm saying I'm controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's not like a gas tank that you need to fill up with emotion or energy. That's not what it means. So here's a simple definition if you're taking notes. To be filled with the Spirit means to be constantly controlled by the Holy Spirit in our mind, emotion, and will. Let me say that again. To be filled with the Spirit means to be constantly controlled by the Holy Spirit in our minds, our emotions, and our will. And I want you to know something. When you experience worship as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it is transformational. And I believe everybody here can experience the true riches of worship as God has it for us by understanding the elements of spirit-filled worship. Can I share those with you? Here's the first element I want you to see. I want you to see the focus of spirit-filled worship. Verse 47 notes something obvious, but just because it's obvious doesn't mean we can pass over. It's very, very important. They were, it says, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They were were praising whom? They were praising God. You say, well, of course they were. That may seem obvious, but a lot of people, and I would venture to say a lot of churches, could fill in that blank with something else. And everybody came together and they were praising blank. Whether it's accomplishments or programs or self-esteem or stuff, we can get easily distracted and we can praise other things. A.W. Tozier said, the presence of God in our midst, bringing a sense of godly fear and holy reverence is largely missing in the church today. And he wrote that several years ago. He said, thus, much of what we call worship, God does not. And I think that's true. The scripture makes it clear there's no such thing as worshipers and non-worshipers, incidentally. Uh, We all worship someone or something. It's a matter of choosing the object of our worship. Anything that we worship other than God has a name in the scripture. What is that? It's an idol, right? An idol. Most of you would not consider yourself an idol worshiper. I wouldn't consider myself an idol worshiper, but have I been an idol worshiper? Of course I have. An idol is anything in my life so central that my life loses meaning if I lose it. It is paramount. It's at the center. And that could be a lot of good things, couldn't it? Career or money, social status, even religious activity. In fact, we love to talk about family and children and parenting in here, don't we, at Kingsland? How many of you know that could be an idol? If you place that above the throne, if you place that more essential than God, then all of a sudden what is beautiful to God becomes idolatry. And when we take our focus off of God, then we're in trouble. You see, when we're controlled by the Holy Spirit, he draws our attention upward to look to God. And we don't get distracted by all these other things. Some of you know that I I grew up in Austin and I pastored in Austin before I came here. One of the things, the quirky things Austin's known for is a bridge, the Congress Avenue Bridge that has uh, a whole uh, herd. What do you call it? A a group. Yes. Colony. Colony, Thank you. Not a herd. You don't have a herd of bats. Thank you. All right. (laughs) A colony. If you want to get specific, I, I just thought I'd go ahead and get that clear because I was going to get about six emails, so I said I'd just save some time, of Mexican free tail bats. And if you hadn't seen it, it's amazing. So at dusk, they come out. It's this massive cloud of like a million and a half, two million bats. I made up that number, but I'm a Baptist preacher. So it's like, it's a lot of bats. All right. And so you got to see it. So when the girls were younger, I wanted them to experience the thrill of the Mexican free tail bats. And so we wanted to do it right. You know, all these people line up on the bridge to see it. But we rented this little boat and, uh, and we brought, we, we had a, a, a bag of takeout fajitas because a family that eats fajitas together stays together. And we had fajitas on the boat. We rode around Town Lake 
And, and then uh, it's called Lady Bird Lake now, but if you're from Austin, you still call it Town Lake. And, and so we're riding around and we're just enjoying the time and dusk comes. And so we think, well, we need to get ready. So we ride over toward the bridge and we look up and we can see people scattering. We thought, what in the world? Why are they leaving? And so I leaned over to another person on another boat. There's a lot of boats in the water. And I said, hey, what time do the bats come? And they go, dude, the bats came. Like they're gone. Man, so we were so caught up in the boat and the fajitas and the time together, we missed the bat and we came to see the bats and blew it. I think that's that's what we do with worship, right? We came to worship Jesus and we get so caught up in this and that and the other and we're like, oh, oh yeah, I forgot. What about Jesus? You see, when the spirit fills us, our focus turns to Jesus, that's, that's how the spirit moves us. Jesus becomes the focus, the focus of spirit-filled worship. Do you see? Here's the second element I want you to see of spirit-filled worship. The fellowship of spirit-filled worship. This is really at the heart of what's happening in Acts 2, isn't it? Uh, the beginning of the church is all about the Holy Spirit of the living God coming upon his people, and they are gathering. They're gathering for worship. That's what they're doing. The Holy Spirit's working in in me, and the Holy Spirit's working in you, and that unites us. I told a story last week about a desert island. I'll tell you another one. There's this dude who's been trapped on a desert island. A ship finds him, rescues him, and I mean, he's been there for three years by himself. You can imagine scraggly beard, ragged clothes, and they're looking on the island. They said, hey, who else is on the island? I said, it's just me. It's just been me. They said, well, are you sure? Yes, absolutely sure. It's just me. Well, then how come there's three huts here? You know, we noticed three huts. He said, well, that's the, that's the hut I built to live in. That's my house. And that other hut, that's my church. And that other hut, that's the church I used to go to. I'm not sure anything divides us more than worship style, is there? And I mean, nothing can do it like worship style. And the opposite should be true because the same Holy Spirit is working in each of us. The Holy Spirit's filling us transforms the conversation about style and gathering. We, we have a core value here at Kingsland we call spirit-led community. And I'll tell you what I treasure about that idea is sometimes we get the false idea that, that the church should have uh, spirit-led prayer and worship, and then we should have fellowship afterward. But those go together all through the scripture. And I have found in my own life, I bet you have as well, that the deepest relationships I've had on this earth were found when we, we were drawn together looking upward with hearts in prayer and worship. And so, so worship and prayer feeds deep friendships and deep friendships feed worship and prayer. That's why every meeting we have ought to be a prayer meeting. Do you see? Because these go hand in hand. And when we gather recognizing we're inviting the spirit of God to work in our lives, then the, the, the focus turns away from my preference or your preference. It's one of the reasons why we don't divide our worship according to music style. Of course, every room has a little bit different uh, a style because of the environment, because of the leaders uh, and instrumentalists, but we're just as likely to do any song in one room as another, no matter wh- whether you go to the courts, or the worship center, or the North Katy campus. Why? Because we're not here to be entertained, but to worship the living God together. Paul spoke of this in depth in an important passage related to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21 says this, and don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. There it is. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Watch. Singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. You see, music is a natural outflow, a byproduct of being filled with the Holy Spirit and coming together. That's what we do. We can't help but sing about what the Lord has done. We worship, we share together what God has done. It reminds me of the conversation Jesus had with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Remember, he's come to her. He's, he's ministering to her heart. It gets uncomfortable. And so she wants to talk about worship style. Well, which one's right, Jesus? Is it the way we worship on this mountain or is it the way they worship back in Jerusalem? And here's what he answers. He doesn't fall trapped to the worship style question. In verse 23 of John 4, Jesus told her, but an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He's saying style and process are the wrong focus. The focus should be the grace you've received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see? That changes everything. 
Incidentally, there's a good chance somebody is watching today. We're so grateful that we can uh, watch and, and, and uh, simulcast this for those who need to be at home or are, are away today. Uh, so you can watch, and we're also worshiping in three locations today. But it's important to know that there are some who've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And that has to be square one for this relationship. And you've wondered why. You know, you've sort of been the outside looking in when it comes to worship or song service. It's because God's inviting you into a relationship, into sonship or daughtership with him that only comes when you receive the grace gift uh, from Jesus Christ that he gave you. Because we're sinners in need of a Savior. Do you see that? And, and, and that's why once we understand the grace that we've been given, it, it completely eradicates the piddly little arguments we might have about style. You can have a favorite style, but when you love the Lord Jesus, you can worship outside that style because you're lifting up Jesus. Did you ever wonder why God saw it of preserving the words to the oldest music of the faith in the book of Psalms, but he didn't preserve the music in those same songs? How did, how did Psalm 23 go? What was the music like? We have no idea. Music style was absolutely not the focus. The Spirit's leading was the focus. They wanted to lift up the name of their Savior with other Christians. They were responding to the Holy Spirit's filling and working in them. Do you see? These elements are so important. We see here, we, we have seen the, uh, the focus of our worship, of spirit-filled worship. We've seen the fellowship of spirit-filled worship. And I want you to see one more. I want you to see the foundation of spirit-filled worship. Now, this is really important, I think. Biblical truth, biblical truth is the foundation of worship. Biblical truth is the root of our passion. And our prayers. I want you to look back at the text and I want to show you something that jumped off the page to me these last few weeks in preparing this message that I had not noticed before. And some of you are going to say, well, pastor, I knew this all along and I, I'm grateful for you. But it just, I just realized this. Look back at verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now stop right there. I just always passed over that and thought, well, if you saw signs and wonders, you'd be filled with awe too. But that's not what's filling them with awe. Everyone was filled with awe already, and then the signs and wonders came. They may be happening simultaneously, but the Greek wording there is that they were consistently filled with awe. And the, the implication here, as I read this, is that the awe is not coming from the signs and wonders at all. I mean, I just thought, well, you know what? If like Sally has never gotten up from her illness after years and years and we're worshiping and praising, and we're praying and all of a sudden Sally gets up, I'd be filled with awe. I mean, that would, that would make you be filled with awe. But the awe was already there, do you see? Where is this wonder coming from? It seems to be that they're awed by the transformation that's taken place in their lives in verses one through 42. If you look at the verses immediately preceding this, look at verses 41 to 42. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. Would that give you a sense of awe? It sure would. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Would that give you a sense of awe? Man, if you've studied the Bible your whole life, and all of a sudden you start to see Jesus, the Gospels, all through the Old Testament, that would fill you with awe. When you start to recognize what the Lord Jesus has done in your life and how the Spirit of God is changing you, that gives you a sense of awe and passion. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, and they're saying, look at what God is doing. That's where the awe comes from. Do you see? They're praying together. They're in the Word together. And they are amazed at what they found. Listen, the early church is not in awe of the signs and wonders. The early believers are in awe, and then there are signs and wonders. It's very important. Why does this matter? Because the foundation of their worship is biblical truth, prayer. It's a big difference. Misplaced priorities in worship take good things and make them dangerous distractions. I want to show you something and go to the marker board for just a second. I want you to see how this works. So the foundation of our worship is supposed to be 
biblical truth. And how does that manifest itself in the early church and in our church? Scripture, we look to the word of God. And what else? And we see prayer. As we look to the truth of the word of God, we pray the truth of the word of God back to the Lord. We're praying together according to the truth of the word of God. This is the foundation of worship. Now, out of that, what else happens? There is activity. And there is emotion. Now, watch this. If truth ceases to be the foundation of worship, the Holy Spirit's filling, remember being controlled by the Holy Spirit, how did that happen? We look to the word of God. The spirit of God speaks to us through the word of God. We respond as the spirit of God empowers us to. We pray according to the spirit of God. When that's the truth, all this is, is overflowing. But when it's not, what if activity becomes the foundation of our worship? Can activity be, become the foundation? What used to be great, becomes kind of dangerous because sometimes activity turns to legalism. If that's the foundation of our worship, we say, well, here's how we worship God, just through our behavior and our activity. Now it just is reduced to, well, I'll tell you how you can know that you're a worshiper. You're just going to follow these 462 rules. If you do these, don't follow 461. If 462, then, then, then you know what? Now, now you're a worshiper. Or sometimes it appears in activity as misplaced priorities in the church. And here's what I mean by that. You can have some really good things, biblical things, that if those become paramount, those become the foundation of worship, everything turns out a kilter. So that could be a lot of stuff. That could be, that could be church activity or programming. It could be study. How many of you know Bible study is important? But if it's all intellectual study, and all you say is, well, we're just going to sit in a room, and, and sometimes people say, well, I just want to go deeper. Okay, you know how you go deeper in the word of God? You read the word of God and you respond as God leads you. you. You're obedient. But if it's all intellectual pursuit, you see how that gets out of kilter? It could be any number of things. It could be political focus. How many of you know we should be good citizens? But if that becomes paramount, that becomes the priority of our worship, then you see how everything else starts to fall out of place. And so activity cannot be the foundation. How many of you know emotion can't be the foundation? Because when emotion is the foundation, it usually ha ends up happening in one of two ways. First, it could be sensationalism. Well, we're just going to kind of drum up some good feelings here. We're going sort to of, sort, of, sort of have a, a holy pep rally and, and, and get all in the feels and out of that, you know, then God will work. Then, then our worship of a holy God only lasts as long as the emotion does, right? Tell you another way that it can also happen is through what I'll call therapeutic liberalism. You see, if I say, well, I want to base our worship on emotion, I want you to be peaceful, so the most important way that I can bring peace to you is tell you you're absolutely okay as you are and nobody needs to change and there is no sin and so now, okay, I can breathe easy so I have peace and therefore I can pretend to have worship. Is that worship? No. Emotion, activity are horrible foundations for worship. But guess what? When the truth of God's word is our foundation, we dive into scripture, when we're praying together according to the truth, we're inviting the spirit of God to fill us, to control us, will there be emotion? Of course there will be. There, it's gonna be passion. It's gonna be an emotional time, but it's overflowing with what God is really doing. Will there be activity when there is the heart of true worship? You better believe it. But it's going to be the outpouring of a response of the Spirit's working in our lives. Do you see? The foundation of Spirit-filled worship is so important. And that's why God calls us to look to God's Word, to pray together, to seek His face, and then we receive our marching orders. This Wednesday, I want to invite you to be a part of something that's really special. Uh, some of you gathered, uh, at least online or in person, for our Restore Prayer Gathering in March. We, we had planned for several months to do that. It was such a precious time of worship for those who are here at North Katy. And uh, so we finished that night. And I said, I don't want to wait another quarter or semester to do this. We need this again. So we're going to have another Restore Prayer Gathering this Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock at North Katy, 6.30 at the Central Campus in the Worship Center. 
We're going to gather, we're going to sing and seek the Lord. We're going to look to God's word and we're going to pray together and pray for one another. It'll be all generations together. We're going to include everybody, the whole family, young and old, to come together and pray. I hope you will join us for that special time because something happens when we seek the face of God. We make him the foundation and our worship overflows out of that. Do you see? The only way to worship God is by the truth of the word of God, which brings us all the way back to the very first essential. The focus of spirit-filled worship is what? Is Jesus. Go back to verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe. When was the last time, when was the last time you were honestly awed by Jesus? I'm not saying you were awed by a, a special that the choir sang or awed by a message or awed, I'm talking about when was the last time you were in awe of the Lord Jesus Christ you see worship is not about a style or a place or a preference it's about Jesus the summer I met my wife Lana I guess we, we literally shook hands and met the summer before but I was a, I was working in youth ministry in Wimberley and I came back and I was looking around for her she had a serious boyfriend and uh, he wasn't living there locally. He was out of state, which is not my problem. <laughs> and so I, we just got to be really good friends, really good friends. Well, as things progress, and I realized I, I really, 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 really like this gal. She still had this boyfriend. I didn't want to appear desperate. So I called a girl from back at college really nice godly young lady and asked her on a date she lived fairly locally and so mainly I did it to be honest with you so I could go tell her hey I got a date tonight and she's like okay enjoy and I'd go out two three times took this young lady out spent some money on pizza or whatever we'd sit there and I'll bet you if you talk to her today she wouldn't tell you man I'll tell you what I'm just I, I hate that I didn't get to marry that Ryan Rush. No, I guarantee you that's not what she's saying. She's like, okay, it was nice enough to have pizza. But let me tell you how that went looking back. I tried to make eye contact, a good conversation. Well, tell me about your summer, what have you. Enjoy the pepperonis, whatever. I don't know what we're talking about. But, but she probably knew, and I certainly knew, that I was honoring her with my presence. But my affections were elsewhere. And the reality is, I wonder how many times, if we could have a God's eye view, that we come in here and worship, and we think we're honoring the Lord with our presence, but in reality, our affections are elsewhere. And my friends, when the Spirit of the living God fills us, controls us, that begins to change. Would you bow with me, church? We're going to move to a time of response. I'm going to pray for us. Before I do, before we sing, I wonder whether in just this quiet moment between you and God, you'd allow the Spirit of God to show you anything He wants to show you today. First of all, I wonder whether there's somebody here or watching online who's never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. This moment is the right one. You're not here by accident. If you're watching online, there's a number on your screen where pastors would be honored to pray with you. You can text, you can call. I hope that you'll do that. Just make this the day of salvation. And there's others, as, as you come before the Lord right now, maybe the Lord is exposing to you an idol in your life that's really the place of your affections, what you dwell on, what you treasure most. And even if it's a good thing, the Lord is inviting you to take that and lay it at the feet of Jesus and say, God, you are the only one worthy of my worship. Lord, mold me and shape me and make me the worshiper that I was saved to be. Perhaps there's another burden on your life I have not even mentioned today, but you need prayer. You need a breakthrough. I hope that you'll just bring that before the Lord. And when we begin to sing in just a moment and there are ministers here, I hope you'll come and allow them the privilege of praying for you. So Heavenly Father, I pray for this time of response. God, as we sing these songs to you, Lord, would you do a work in our hearts? 
Would you bring us to decision? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.